Temple. My name's Megan Mays, coming to you from Calvary Temple stage, so new location today. I'm one of the youth coordinators here at Calvary Temple. Comment down below how your day is going. And I'm Keith Hart. I'm also one of the youth coordinators here at Calvary Temple. Um, today, we're really excited. We have a guest speaker coming at you. Um, Pastor Marsha Mays is going to bring the word, and she's talking about the power of words today. Speaking of words, Keith, are there any words that you hear all the time that you just don't like? Um, yeah, I think one for me, um, I have no clue why this word annoys me so much, but it does. Um, when people call me buddy, and people are like, hey, what's up, buddy? I hate that. I don't know why. I can't handle it. And I'm always like, what the heck? And I don't know. I feel like it's like kind of a nice thing to say, but yet I hate it. So I don't know. How about you, Megan? What's your least favorite word? Um, I have to say probably, I have quite a few, but <laughs> probably the word fluid. Um, as a virtual teacher, at the start of the school year when lots of things weren't figured out, the school districts like to say things are fluid and no one really knew what that meant. So it kind of caused a lot of anxiety because you never knew what news you're going to be told next. I also kind of don't like when everyone uses the word literally instead of figuratively. <laughs> like they laugh so hard they literally peed their pants and I'm like, did you really? Or are you figuratively <laughs> speaking? So yeah. those are a couple words that I don't really like. That's so true about literally. Um, definitely see that a lot. Um, but speaking of your least favorite words, what's some words that you use a lot or some words that you like to use? That's kind of a tough one, Keith, because I feel like I haven't been saying just one word. Recently to my first grade students, the thing I keep saying over and over is, you're on mute, <laughs> mainly when they're just trying to talk to me or ask a question. <laughs> nice, nice. What are some of your favorite words, Keith? Um, tough question. I had to think about it for a bit. Um, I use the word fire a lot. I describe everything as that's so fire, that looked fire. Everything's just fire all the time. This sermon's about to be fire. Um, <laughs> and giving away my secrets here, but all the time I say, ha, yeah, when I didn't know what someone said. So if I say, ha, yeah, I probably didn't hear what you said. I'm just, <laughs> just rolling with it. So who knows what I've laughed and said, yeah. But um, that's, my, <laughs> that's my favorite go-tos, I guess. I'm so excited to hear Pastor Marsha May speak on the power of words because a lot of the times we really don't think about how much power our words have behind them and how sometimes we can't take them back. That's so good, Megan. That's so true. I actually found a um, scripture in Colossians 4, um, verse 6 that says, Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Um, I think that's so important for us to remember today that um, we as Christians need to be above um, and our standards need to be higher than that of um, the world and I think about that with myself a lot um, if somebody heard me talking would they see Jesus in any of my conversations would they be like that's an attractive conversation because it's about Jesus or would it turn them off from Jesus and um, that's something I've been thinking about in my own life a lot um, at any time in my day at any point in my life if someone came in and watched my words watched my conversation um, would they know that I'm a follower of Jesus or would they think that I'm definitely not a follower of Jesus? Or um, what would they think about me? Um, and that's something that we need to be thinking a lot about. And Pastor Marsha is going to expand on that um, today. And so, yeah, we can't wait to get into it. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, I pray that we remember the importance and the power behind our words this week. Just like your words can heal any sick, I pray that we just take after you and remember that our words hold worth and power. And I just pray that we remember that today. And I pray that you bless this service today in your name that we pray.
darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation, Jesus for our sake you died. Till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth.
love is like rain. Your love is like rain. Come on, say it again. Your love is like rain. You don't have a ton of things in common with God, but there is one thing. You speak. So does he. God spoke light into existence with his words. I wonder what you could speak into existence with your words this week. I wonder what kind of love you could speak into your marriage that feels like it's in neutral. I wonder what kind of courage you could speak into the heart of a child who's hurting. 
wonder what kind of peace you could speak into your broken friendship, what kind of hope you could speak into your own weary soul. I want you to know that the most powerful words you're gonna speak this week is probably not gonna be on a stage or a conference call or closing the deal with a client that you want. The most powerful words you're gonna speak is probably just with one or two people listening, maybe zero. It's totally possible that the most powerful sentence you'll say this week is a thoughtful text message that you send to a friend who's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. It's the apology email that you finally get the courage to send it's the whispered prayers through tears in the middle of a dark night. Powerful words aren't just for preachers who stand behind pulpits. They're for parents who stand next to bunk beds. Speak life with their kids. For spouses who share hopes and dreams during pillow talk, not criticism. For teenagers who stand up to bullies, stand up for the uncool kids. Your tongue is so small, but so powerful. Your tongue is telling a story. Wow, hadn't this been a great worship service? You know, I'm really excited about today's message. You guys are in for a real treat this morning because today we have an amazing guest speaker that has been speaking powerful words of wisdom into my life for almost 41 years. This morning we have the privilege of hearing a, a dynamic message from our administrative pastor here at Calvary Temple, Marcia Mays. You know, in a few weeks, Marcia and I will celebrate 41 amazing years of marriage. All I can say is, I'm truly blessed to have had the privilege of spending each and every day with this wonderful lady. You know, a couple of weeks ago, Marcia uh, shared a message with our youth and young adults about the power of words. And I really felt like this was a message that we all need to hear right now. And so I asked her to share it with all of us today. So I want you to open up your spirit, open up your ears to hear the word of the Lord today. And let's please welcome this morning, my wife, Pastor Marcia Mays. Thank you for joining us today. It is an honor for me to share a few words with you this morning. And um, I chose the text, James chapter three, verses one through 12. And I like it in the NLT version. Um, if you have your Bible at home, read along with me. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make mistakes for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and can also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth and a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing and it makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. We all have access to a powerful weapon that can be used in any situation to make things better or to make things worse, our words. Anyone with the ability to say the right thing at the right time or to keep from saying the wrong thing at the wrong time will find themselves successful in every area of life, including their business and personal relationships. I wish I could say I had mastered that, but I have not. Uh, the Bible warns us that it is impossible to have complete control over our tongue. Um, as a matter of fact, our text in verse 8 says no one can tame the tongue. But the Bible offers a great deal of advice on how we can manage our tongue and 
speak words in such a way that our conversations give glory to God. Today, I'd like for us to spend just a few moments looking at ways we can become better at managing the things we say. And I might add just a side note here. Social media has caused some of us to be bold and careless with the words we type or write on our social media accounts. So we also need to learn to manage those words better also. Uh, today, we're going to discover that changing our words can literally change our lives and changing our words can also change lives of others. As we examine James chapter three, there are four things I'd like for us to notice. First of all, we need to be aware of the damage that we can cause with our words spoken or typed. One of the biggest lies I think we tell our children is that sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you. I was told that when I was younger, and I feel certain I told my own children that. And if it were true, I always wondered why words hurt so much. When I was in elementary school, I fell off of the slide and I broke my wrist. I remember wearing a cast. I remember I even had to go to physical therapy for a while. And I know that that was a painful experience. But as I look back, I don't remember what that pain felt like. However, there are scenes from my childhood, like the bus ride where no one would move over and let me sit next to them, or being called Martian virus as I walked down the hallway, or even worse, that when they're recalled, the pain of that moment remains fresh, even after all of these years. Our words are powerful. And if you stop and think about it, the words we say can create most of the problems that we face. You know, most problems at church or in the workplace are a result of words. Many divorces are not caused by infidelity or desertion. They're caused by words. Most conflicts between parents and children are not the result of a generational gap. They're a result of words. I've seen parents continually belittle their children, and I've seen children who continually belittle their parents. This makes for hostility and creates problems. We need to remember that our words carry tremendous weight, and they can cause an enormous amount of damage. The Bible says, in Proverbs 12, 18, in the NIV, reckless words pierce like a sword. Or I love the way the NLT says, some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise are bring healing. I want to bring healing. I want to be wise with my words. Perhaps you've heard this saying, harsh words break no bones, but they do break hearts. This is exactly what James means when he says in verse 6, the tongue is a flame of fire. We must be mindful of the fact that our words are weapons. They have the power to destroy. The next thing I also would like for us to notice in this passage of scripture is number two, words cannot be taken back. When you were a kid, did you ever say something that you had to take back? I remember once in class, there was um, this kid that said something cruel about uh, this little girl named Donna. And he said it because she was wearing glasses and she had braces on her teeth. And when he said his remark, most of the class laughed, except Donna. The teacher became angry and made the boy take it back. So he walked over to the little girl's desk and he mumbled, I take it back. She just stared at her book. And even then, I wondered how the phrase, I take it back, was supposed to make things better. It was plain to see it didn't work. Donna's feelings were hurt, and nothing that that little boy said could change it. That doesn't alleviate the fact that we can and should apologize when we do something wrong, but we must remember that once you say words, they can never be taken back. Words once spoken can never be taken back. You know, I'm reminded of this story that I heard a long time ago. It's about a story about a Haitian woman who had spread malicious gossip about a neighbor. And in confessional with the priest, she confessed that sin. And she asked the priest, what could she do to make it right? He told her, pluck a chicken and place a feather by the gate of the house of each person with whom she had shared the gossip and then report back to him the next day. She went and did this. And when she came back, he said, now go to each house and pick up the feather that you left there. The lady looked at him and she said, that's impossible. By now those feathers have blown all over town. And the priest said, and so have your words. Our words are powerful. 
I have a pastor friend that tells the story of flying from Salt Lake City to St. Louis. He was flying Southwest Airlines, which allows passengers to select their seat on a first come first serve basis. The flight was full and an attractive young couple were unable to find two seats together. And there was a vacant seat next to my pastor friend and a vacant seat in front of him. So generously, he offered to take the empty seat in front of him so they could have his seat and the empty one next to it. They thanked him and they each squeezed into their new seats. But less than 30 seconds after they sat down, he realized he had made a big mistake. These two people were not the happy couple they appeared to be. Apparently, they were in an argument and had been all morning, which they resumed as soon as they sat down, and he couldn't help but hear it. He never quite figured out what the argument was really about, but it stemmed from the fact that she said something he didn't like. And they were going round and round about it. She would say, but I didn't mean it. And he would say, but you said it. She would say, but I take it back. And he would say, you can't take it back. That's how you really feel. And she would say, I wasn't thinking. I was really mad. And he would say, it doesn't matter if you were mad. You still said it. And on and on and on this went across Utah, Wyoming, Colorado, Kansas, and on into St. Louis, Missouri. He never did figure out what she said, but he had a suspicion that she'll never be able to forget it. Now, obviously, this man could learn a lesson in forgiveness, and I'm not taking sides in their argument, but what I am saying is this. We will save ourselves a great deal of trouble if we will resist saying something mean-spirited in the heat of anger, because the fact is, once words are spoken, they can't be taken back. Another thing I'd like us to remember as we look at this passage of Scripture is your words reveal much about you. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 1234, in the ESV, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, or I am very partial to the NLT, Matthew 12, 34 says, for whatever is in your heart determines what you say. What's that word saying right there? It's saying that whatever's in your heart is eventually going to come out of your mouth. If your heart is critical and cold and bitter, your words will be also. James says in verse 12, does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Our words reveal our character. A few years ago, a friend of mine who lives in the South was visiting relatives on the East Coast, and he told me that everywhere he went, whenever he opened his mouth, people would ask, oh, what part of the South are you from? Now, he wasn't aware of his accent, but every time he spoke, he revealed to others where he was from. Our words work the same way on another level. Just as your accent reveals where you are from, your words reveal the state of your heart. Listen to this verse from Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verses 12 through 14. A fool is consumed by his own lips. At the beginning, his words are folly. At, by the end, they are wicked madness, and the fool multiplies his words. Our words betray us, and we must remember that they reveal our true character. Again, I'm reminded of Matthew 12, 34 that we spoke of earlier in our, um, in our conversation. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever is in your heart determines what you say. But you know, fortunately for us, the Bible also teaches us that there is a way we can change what we are uh, revealing with our words. Because the fourth thing I want us to look at today is changing your character begins with changing your words. Um, verse number two in our text, James chapter three, verse number two. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. I'm glad the Bible recognizes that I make many mistakes. It goes on to say, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. Do you have trouble controlling your tongue? Do you want to be a better person, a better Christian? I will be the first to admit that I don't always control my tongue like I, I should. Many times we hurt others by our words. I mentioned earlier that social media has caused us to become reckless with our words. You know, some folks seem to think that they can voice their opinion and many times with incredibly harsh words. Our words hurt others because our words are powerful. Looking across uh, the different genres of social media, it is apparent that we need to change how we use our words. The Bible tells us that changing our words and how we use our words can change our character. I ran across um, this video of Rabbi Joseph Telushkin, and um, I just copied his words here, and I'd like to share them with you. Um, he um, says that over the past decade, whenever I have lectured throughout the country on powerful and often negative impact of words, I have asked audiences if they can go 24 hours without saying any unkind words about or to anybody. 
Invariably, a minority of listeners raise their hands saying yes. Some laugh, and quite a large number call out no. Rabbi Telushkin responds by saying, those who can't answer yes must recognize that you have a serious problem. If you cannot go 24 hours without smoking, you're addicted to nicotine. If you cannot go 24 hours without a drink, you're most likely an alcoholic. Similarly, if you cannot go 24 hours without saying an unkind word about others, then you've lost control of your tongue. Many of us need to heed the words found in Psalm 141.3. Take control of what I say, O Lord, and guard my lips. You know, psychologists say that if you will change the words you use to describe your emotions, you can change the way you feel. If instead of saying, I am furious with you, you say, you know, I'm a little annoyed, you'll be able to better control your anger. Because Proverbs 15.1 in the NLT says, a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. I'm going to repeat that again. Proverbs 16 or 15.1, a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. You know, that may seem simplistic, too easy to be true, but it's worth a try. I know because it's worked for me. Using softer words to communicate anger not only helps you control your emotions, it helps the other person control theirs. Let me ask you this morning. What do you think is more effective? Saying to someone, you know, I'm a little annoyed or saying, I'm so mad at you, you stupid idiot. Eh, you know, the answer I think is kind of obvious. You have a better chance of salvaging the situation if you use the softer language. Changing your character begins with changing your words. Um, as we were speaking about Rabbi Joseph Telushkin earlier, he also uh, proposed several years ago, he proposed an annual Speak No Evil Day. Eventually, Sen Senator Connie Mack from Florida introduced a resolution to the Senate that would designate May 14, 1996 and May 14, 1997 as Speak No Evil Day. The resolution would establish such a date requesting that the president issue a proclamation calling on the American people to eliminate all hurtful and unfair talk for 24 hours, transmit negative information only when necessary, monitor and regulate how they speak to others, Strive to keep anger under control, argue fairly, and not allow disputes to generate into name-calling or other forms of verbal abuse, and speak about others with the same kindness and fairness that they would wish others to exercise when speaking about them. You know, sadly, that resolution was referred to committee, which is where all good bills go to die. In other words, the resolution never became official. You know, I don't know about you, but I think that resolution should be resurrected today. Looking around at our world today, we certainly could benefit from a Speak No Evil Day. I believe a Speak No Evil Day could plant the seed of a more permanent shift in our consciousness. It would hopefully touch everyone from journalists, politicians, activists, teachers, ministers, businessmen, to mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, sons, and daughters. Simply stated, we should all do two things. We should decrease the number of bad things we say and increase the number of good things we say. This formula will help us manage our tongue. Remember though, that James warns us that no man can tame the tongue, only with the help of the Holy Spirit can we do so. So what that's telling us this morning is, is that we're gonna fail. We're gonna fail in this area, but we don't need to beat ourselves up. We just need to keep trying. Just get back up, say today is a new moment. I'm gonna try again. The tongue is powerful. And we are a work in progress. So I challenge you, remember, our words are powerful. We must use them for good. Make it your goal to control your tongue instead of allowing your tongue to control you. The whole point I'm trying to make today is that we have the potential to do great, word, great good with our words or great harm. Our words are a powerful weapon. The potential good and the potential harm is not only directed at others, but at ourselves. I made this statement at the beginning of this message. We all have access to a powerful weapon that can be used in any situation to make things better or to make things worse. Those are our words. First Peter chapter three, verse 10 in the NLT says, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and keep your lips from telling lies. The message from God's word is so plain. Change your words and you can change your life. Change your words 
and you can change the lives of others also. Can it be that simple? Yes, it really can. Looking at this world we live in today, it's obvious that we need to be reminded over and over and over the power of our words. Will you join me in striving to place more thought into your words and attempt to say more positive things than negative and resolve to honor others with your words? Because that would be pleasing to Jesus. Again, it's been a privilege today to share with you uh, what the Lord has laid on my heart. And as we close today, I'd like to just ask you, if you're watching this morning, if you don't know Jesus as your very best friend, if he's not uh, number one in your life, you can change that right now. It's very simple. You just can just say right now, Jesus, I just surrender my whole life to you. I've made a mess of it. And I just am asking you to come and take away all of the hurt, all of the pain, uh, take away um, all of the sin in my life. Fill me with your joy and your peace. Reign in my life and be my very best friend. It's really that simple. And this morning, maybe you're watching and the words that I spoke had a powerful impact on you. Maybe you're recognizing that maybe you don't care for the person that your words portray you to be and you wanna make changes. That can be also very simple. You could just simply say, Jesus, help me to control my tongue. Help me to say more positive things than negative. I want to be a person of character and integrity, and I want to use my words in a positive way. You know, that's very simple. You can ask Jesus for that. And then the last thing that I would like to pray about today is that I want to encourage you with is that maybe you're watching this morning and someone has hurt you with their words and you're just harmed. Your heart is hurt this morning because of words that have been spoken to you. And I wanna encourage you this morning that God made you in his image. He loves you with an everlasting love. And if you ask him to heal you and mend you of those hurts, he will. And so this morning, would you just pray with me? Father, today, I'm so thankful again for this precious opportunity. I pray, Lord, that you would um, save those that need to be saved that you would help those of us that need to do a better job with controlling our words, help us to do that. And for those of us this morning that are watching that have been hurt by words, heal and mend their hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Again, thank you for spending your morning with us here at Calvary Temple. God bless you and have a great week.